Um, Minister, as you'll know, the Treasury issued waivers to sanctions yes. that allowed Prigozhin to fly his lawyers to St Petersburg yeah. to perfect a case to sue Elliot Higgins in an yeah. English court because Elliot Higgins had revealed Prigozhin's role at the head of the Wagner Group and Prigozhin wanted to undermine that story because he felt that story had led to sanctions being imposed. Yeah. Do you want to just take this opportunity to apologise to Mr Higgins for Her Majesty's Government having issued that sanctions waiver leading to him being sued in an English court? I bet it'll be a no. Well, uh, all I will say, because this is actually a Treasury lead, all I will say is that given recent cases, the um, Treasury ministers are considering this approach um, and considering whether or not change is possible. I mean, clearly the approach taken by the uh, Treasury's uh, office, the Office for Financial Sanctions Implementation, it's been, it was, they did that for constitutional reasons, um, but I think following this, the case that you mentioned, I, I think it's right to say we are certainly considering this approach. The government is considering this approach. Do you want to take this opportunity to apologise to Mr Higgins? Well, I don't think that's government? probably. I don't think that's. I don't think it's useful for me to comment on the specific case. I think it's useful for me to make a comment about our general approach, which I've done. Mr Higgins had to spend £67,000 on his legal defence. Prigozhin spent £102,000, money which he's not coughed up yet. Will there be compensation available to Elliot Higgins because of the cost he incurred because of a sanctions waiver <coughs> issued by Her Majesty's Government? I can't, uh, I can't comment one way or another, frankly. When the Exchequer Secretary came to the House to explain what was going on, he said that there was a copy of a delegated... Or he said there was a delegated authority framework that meant that officials took the decisions on sanctions waivers. Did the Foreign Office sign off on that framework? I can't say. Do you know, Ben? I can't say. I, I, I simply don't know the answer to that question. So when you said earlier... Uh, it doesn't really much, does it? ...earlier that you were completely joined up across government and the Foreign Office was the home of the Russia unit. Mm -hmm. You can't tell us whether you signed off on the... I can, I can check. I mean, clearly, um, it's, it's, it's extremely likely we did, but I, well, I'd have to check. I wouldn't, I've got, I wouldn't have confidence answering now. No. It, but it does seem fundamental to the effectiveness of our sanctions regime for which the Foreign Office is responsible. Would you agree? I think being joined up is something we want to achieve, yeah. But do you think the sanctions waiver regime is something that the Foreign Office should take an interest in? I think we, well, I think we absolutely do. Um, and I think that's been reflected in my remarks. How does your department and how do you monitor what sanction waivers officials are issuing? Well, that would be through uh, uh, communication between departments. How do, how do you personally monitor that? Um, well, I would, uh, I would, that would be, uh, advice would be given to me by officials. On sanction waivers? Um, yeah. I would hope so. How many uh, bits of advice have come to you about sanction about, waivers? About sanction issued? waivers, none, specifically. How do you think officials and ministers ended up on such different pages about what waivers should be issued to which Russian warlords? I think... Having not been involved in those decisions, it would, be, it would be speculation for me to answer that, so I think that would be very useful. What are we going to do and what are you going to do now in order to make sure that there is a political grip yeah. on decisions about sanction waivers in general and sanction waivers to Russian warlords in particular? Well, as I've said, Treasury ministers are considering this, so I think as part of that consideration... Um, will identify how that might be achieved. What are you asking the Treasury for in that review? Well, I think um, consider exactly how the balance of our constitutional obligations might be fulfilled whilst also uh, keeping our 
the utility of our foreign policy in mind, frankly. And when you say the constitutional position, do you mean the guidance on financial sanctions implementation? Well, I mean, quite simply, the right to, to for everyone for to, to the right to everyone to legal representation. Quite simply, you will know, no doubt, section six point one point six point six point one of that guidance, which specifically says there is not a general right to access the UK legal system. It says, where sanctions prohibit certain actions, you need to carefully consider whether your advice and support for the client is helping them comply with sanctions or is participating in or facilitating a breach. Mm. Now, Mr. Prigozhin's lawyers sent emails saying that their intention was to undermine Elliot Higgins and Bellingcat mm. because they saw his reporting as responsible for the sanctions implemented on him. Mm. So here was a legal action that was deliberately aimed at undermining the sanctions that the Treasury had recommended. Yeah. So there was no general right to use the English legal system as a legal weapon mm. against Elliot Higgins. So I'm not quite sure what is the constitutional position that needs revising. Well, I think that that's an interesting point. I think that will be taken into account when the Treasury uh, review this. But this is the Treasury's guidance already. Mm. It was clearly no, I mean, breached yeah. by a Crown agent, a Crown servant, reporting to a Minister of the Crown. Yes. I, I think as Treasury Ministers consider this case and the general approach, the, the point... The guy, sadly, and Liam Byrne have been watching him for five minutes. He's incredibly tetchy. He's clearly got some on his mind, doesn't he? What you make, I think, is, is entirely relevant. But your department is responsible for sanctions. Mm. What, therefore, are you asking Treasury for in this review? It's not a review. I mean, I think we... It was. Click, well, because uh, it's a consideration. What we will do is consider whether it should be more joined up and in whether or not there's, there's an argument for, for, for getting the balance right. So the, the reference you draw to, to that document is it's entirely relevant. Um, what, what do you kind of think went wrong here? Well, I, I think that's... To, to, I, I, I couldn't usefully comment. Uh, Dave, did you want to come in there briefly? Yeah, it's a shame you can't comment, Minister, because you told me uh, earlier on... Uh, before Mr Byrne went through that whole timeline. You told me earlier on you are quite confident yet government had a joined-up approach to this. Yep. So that can't just be ministers, that has to be the bureaucracy as well. And so the civil servant that got blamed for this decision in the UQ or statement, whichever it was last week, um, I think many of us on the back benches feel it's inconceivable that somebody would be empowered to make that decision yet wouldn't know who Yevgeny Prigozhin was and that might have had to go up the line for some ministerial oversight. So I would argue that demonstrates that it is not a tight organisation and there is not sufficient grip on this issue. Would you not agree? No, I wouldn't. So I think uh, if you look at our Ukraine policy, our, our, our policy at countering Putin's aggression in Ukraine... It's a different thing. Yeah, I know, but it's, 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 the, the, the point I would make is that it is a... It is a a, a joined-up operation across no, departments. No, and, and this this case is a cause for reconsideration. And I think we will reflect and we'll work uh, with Treasury colleagues to uh, to consider what might have done been done differently. But uh, this narrow, well, I think this, our response is joined up by and large. And this narrow and specific transaction of government about these sanctions, it was not joined up. But you've said that it is joined up. Well, it is, it is joined up, um, and we will, we will consider whether or not there should have been a different outcome to this particular case, but... Is there uh, any dubiety about that? We, we will consider that, but I think it's fair enough, fair to say that uh, the government is joined up in its institutional response to the challenge of deterring and countering Russian aggression in Ukraine. Thank you. Um, Bob, did you still want to come in there? Just very, just very quickly, Minister. You, you said that everyone has a right to legal representation. Do you, you recognise the difference between the right to legal re representation and the right to use the law to, progress, to aggressively pursue journalists and others 
in, in what is known as slaps cases. These are effectively to use the law to yeah. silence your opponents. Do you, do you recognise a difference between that? Or do you think the right to legal representation is the same as the right to pursue journalists and others through the courts in order to bankrupt them and silence them? No, of course I recognise the difference. Uh, I, I refer to the, like, the right to legal uh, representation to give context to the approach, I think, that was probably applied by OFSI uh, at the outset of this individual case. So you're saying that they, they assume precaution, <coughs> they allow precaution to use the law because they were assuming he had the right to legal representation? No, I didn't say that, no. no. Okay, I so just, what are you saying? I said, I said uh, the context is our constitutional convention that everyone has the right to representation. That's, that's what I said. Okay. Why does that apply in this case when he wasn't facing a criminal investigation himself um, but was using the law to aggressively pursue his enemies. I can't usefully comment about this particular case because I was not the decision maker and I've already said that Treasury Ministers will consider this approach. You're defending the actions of the government on the grounds that well, everyone has a right to legal representation and, and what Liam and I think Dave have, have pointed out and myself as well is, do you recognise a difference between legal representation in this no, case? No, you're, you're, you're mischaracterising right my words. People? You're mischaracterising my words. I said the approach was informed by our constitutional convention that everyone has the right to representation. I didn't make any specific reference to this case. I want to be very clear on that. Uh, where I did specifically refer to this case is that Treasury colleagues will consider whether this, uh, this sort of case should be handled differently. I th please, Liam, go on. Sorry, just to flog this, but please. Um, do you recognise that the Convention on the Right of Legal Representation is not an unfettered... Of course I recognise right. that, yeah. Of course right. I recognise that. Constraints. And because there are constraints, someone has to make a judgement. I recognise that, yes. And that judgement, in this case, we are told was a civil servant, although we are yet to learn as to whether it went to a special advisor in the yeah. department. And we still don't know whether a Treasury minister actually signed yeah, correct. I mean, that's exactly correct. And I think the consideration is on whether or not that judgment was correct. That will be the specific focus of the consideration. So you've correctly uh, characterised that. What do, you, what do you think, Minister? Do you think it was correct? Well, it's not for me to say. You're a minister. Well, it's not for me to say. You have an opinion. It's not for me to say. Have no opinion. Okay. I think what I will say uh, before we move on to Sakib is that we as a committee are aghast at the treatment of Elliot Higgins and that we would want to put on our record mm. that we would never want to see such shameful uh, practices again. And I, as a former civil servant, because politicians are often attacked for criticising civil servants, am frankly appalled that any civil servant of any grade would see that name and not think it had to go to a special advisor, at minimum, if not a minister. Yeah. So I do think there are many more questions that this committee will want to follow. No, um, but I think we would like to make that very clear. You know Saki, that. please. Thank you. Uh, we'll just leave it there. I found that fascinating, that conversation. I thought Leo Doherty looked incredibly shady, looked incredibly out of his depth. But the one thing I did pick up, I wanted to mention it there, that, that little grin he gave to Liam Docker, uh, Liam Byrne, should I say, after, after he finished it, and it went to, um, I've forgotten the the SMP MP for for the moment. I'm sure you'll you'll remind remind me in the in the comments below. Please forgive me. He, he's, I just his name has for, just scared me. But I thought that little sly little grin on his face spoke volumes. This is a guy who's he's just he clearly thinks he's the bee's knees, don't he? he? Thinks he knows it all, and he just. Look, he just looks out of his depth, don't he? 